Alrighty, shall we get started? I'll do uh, a little introduction. Um, so thank you for coming today. We are talking to Megan about her master's research. She will introduce herself. Um, but just at the uh, beginning here, I'd like to say thanks to our um, funders, which are the Region of Queens um, and the Queen Foundation, who are bringing us our summer, summer seminars this summer, webinars. Um, yeah, and uh, we also like to do um, an acknowledgement that the seminar is happening um, here in Guestwick, virtual Guestwick, uh, one of the seven districts of Mi'kmaq, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, we acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship, and we thank the Mi'kmaq people for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. Um, that being said, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'll give it over to Megan. Um, if you have questions during uh, the seminar, if you could just put them in the chat down below um, and we'll do a general discussion at the end. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Megan. Right, let me just get my, try and share my screen. All right, are you guys all able to see that? That's perfect. <laughs> all right, so good afternoon, everyone. As Emma said, my name is Megan Pignello. So I recently received my master's from Dalhousie, my master's of resource and environmental management. And since then, I am now currently the land trust coordinator with the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, and I'm working to support the Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas Project. So much, much, much of my master's research, sorry, focused on habitat connectivity and road ecology, which is what led me to my final master's project, which has a very short title, as you can see here, but it's How Did the Deer Across the Road? A Feasibility Assessment of Mitigation Strategies to Increase Connectivity Across Highways, Nova Scotia Highways 103 and Highway 3. Um, so if you guys do have any questions throughout the presentation, you go ahead and you can write them in that little question box and we can answer them at the end or you can just save them till then, whichever you prefer. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I will take you through the project background and study area. We'll look at the feasibility assessment and actually apply it to a couple sites and then finish off with some next steps before opening up the floor to questions. So first, what even is habitat connectivity? So as illustrated in this graphic, roads and other forms of development, as well as some natural causes, have led to significant habitat fragmentation. And habitat fragmentation is actually considered a top threat to species within temperate zones, which Nova Scotia is. Habitat fragmentation can be addressed through mitigation efforts to increase this connectivity and try to actually connect those habitat patches back together. This is important because it allows for wildlife to move within their habitat or to new, better suited habitat, also allows for migration and increased genetic diversity, as well as some other benefits. So with that, we'll get started and look at the project background and study area. So this project um, is actually based off of conclusions made in the 2018 Halifax Green Network Plan, specifically about habitat connectivity within the Shabukdo Peninsula here in HRM. So more specifically, the Halifax Green Network Plan states that the peninsula is largely disconnected from the mainland by roads and development, which has created barriers to wildlife movement. If concerted efforts are not undertaken to mitigate and avoid impacts to landscape connectivity, the functioning of the peninsula for the wildlife and overall ecological health will be severely compromised. So one way that this can be done and addressed is through the use of these wildlife corridors, which are linear habitat paths that connect two or more patches of fragmented habitat. So this is actually one of the maps that accompanied the Halifax Green Network Plan. So you'll, if you're familiar with the area, this is the Shabakto Peninsula. And then within the plan, they've actually identified two, import, two essential, sorry, and one important wildlife corridors across highways 103 and highway three. So that's at the top of the map there in the box. Um, this is a screen grab from a Google Maps, but I find it just, it's a little easier to see. There's not as many colors happening. So this is the study area. And as you can see at the top here, we've got Highway 103 and Highway 3, and they literally bisect the peninsula. So this is fragmenting the habitat, stopping movement from the peninsula to the mainland, but also restricting movement back from the mainland to the peninsula. 
This is a pressing concern because the peninsula is one of the region's most important and vulnerable natural areas as it's comprised of large undisturbed patches of wilderness which are home to an abundance of different wildlife populations and as you can see they're virtually cut off from the rest of the province. So the um, the corridors in the Halifax Green Network Plan look at the connectivity in terms of the entire corridor, looking at this whole area. My project specifically was only looking at mitigation options to allow movement at certain pinch points within this area. A pinch point or a bottleneck refers to an area where wildlife movement is funneled to, which can be the result of natural or man-made features. And in this case, it's a result of human development. So more specifically, the goal of this feasibility assessment was to compare the various mitigation strategies to increase connectivity in this area. And this was done through identifying the species on the peninsula that would benefit from increased connectivity, determining which mitigation strategies exist, and then determining the feasibility criteria to compare them against, determining the feasibility of each mitigation strategy, and then identifying the best options to maintain and or improve connection in this area. So the feasibility assessment had several steps to it, as I just kind of outlined. So we'll go through them kind of step by step just to see what went into creating the entire uh, feasibility assessment. As for mitigation options, there are actually over 40 different options available. Um, but it's important to note here that a lot of these mitigation options are focused on reducing wildlife vehicle collisions and not actually focused on uh, structural connectivity or uh, kind of trying to create these corridors. And this is something that came up again and again in the data and needed to be uh, considered. Within mitigation strategies, most of them can be sorted into three overarching themes, the first of which is public awareness. And these types of mitigation options are meant to change motorist behavior and includes things like speed signs, warning signs, and animal detection systems. The second category is deterrence, and these are looking at changing animal behavior by deterring them from even attempting to cross the road, such as things like lights, desalting agents, and reflectors. And the third category is infrastructure. And this category is not looking at changing a behavior, but is actually looking instead at changing the, the environment. And this would include things like underpasses, overpasses, and fencing. So based on all of the available mitigation options and through an extensive re uh, review of literature, a focus was placed on public awareness and infrastructure because the deterrence just in its name uh, implies that we're not even trying to get animals to cross roads at all. So that would not be uh, increasing connectivity at all. So uh, we were looking at options that either by themselves increase connectivity or that could be used in combination with other options to increase connectivity. And we came up with six. So the first two fall under public awareness. So we've got animal detection systems and wildlife crossing signs. The third is actually a hybrid between public awareness and infrastructure, and these are wildlife crosswalks. And then the last three are fencing, overpasses, and underpasses, which all are a form of infrastructure. Within these infrastructure options, they actually can be broken down further. So we'll look at fencing and look at both small and large mammal fencing and overpasses and underpasses. There are large, multi-use and small that all were considered in this feasibility assessment. The next step was to decide which criteria to actually compare all these mitigations against. Um, and it became quickly clear that there is no one size fits all option for increased connectivity, but instead there are four overarching criteria that need to be eva evaluated on a case by case and location by location basis. And these four criteria are effectiveness of achieving the mitigation goals, uh, species, location, and the costs. So within the study, the criteria are then each ranked into three different categories. We have green for most feasible, yellow for partially feasible with adaptation, and red for not feasible or not recommended. These classifications uh, were all based off of thresholds that were used in similar studies across North America. And then within each of these criteria, as we go through them all, you'll see kind of what each threshold is and what classifies it as being feasible or not feasible. So this is what our first one would look like. <coughs> so while this study focused on increasing connectivity as a means of connecting this fragmented habitat, um, but uh, as I noted, a lot of the literature actually looks at it in terms of a reduction in wildlife vehicle collision. So for that reason, this criteria was then broken down into those two uh, sub criteria. So this means that the effectiveness of these mitigation options is most often 
measured in these reduction in wildlife vehicle collisions. And that, of course, is important. Keeping the animals alive is very important, but that's not the same as increasing the wild, uh, connectivity. So here we can just see kind of the, uh, the criteria that or how they were categorized, sorry. So for green, for um, being feasible, it's greater to or equal to 80% effectiveness. Yellow, we see between 50 and 80% effective, and red would be less than 50% effective. And we can see it obvious that the, the, two th the reduction in wildlife vehicle collisions does not necessarily correlate with structural connectivity. We can also see that several of these mitigation options, actually four of them, do not uh, increase connectivity. They were left in the study, however, because they can often be used in combination with other um, mitigation options to increase connectivity. So we wanted to keep them in to be able to look at things like their feasibility and their costs and their location-specific requirements. Next was to examine which species should be considered. So this was actually done through consultation with local experts and a list of species was compiled. They were then further sorted into guild and a guild is defined as a group of species that exploit the same class of environmental resources in a similar way. And in this case, they were sorted into guilds that depict the type of crossing requirements they would need. So you can see here, we've got obligates uh, which require our prey species, sorry, and require openness and escape options. Generalists favor dry, medium, large structures that are wider than they are tall. And specialists have very species specific requirements, often as a result of mobility or movement patterns. So on the right hand side there, you can see we identified 13 species within the study area of importance, and seven of them fall under this generalist category, which means they prefer medium to large structures that are dry and have good sight lines. And I can tell you now that that does foreshadow what we're going to be seeing as the results of most of our feasibility assessments in this area. I will also point out just a few species of interest that we identified. So one is the mainland moose. Uh, which is an endangered species here in Nova Scotia. Uh, the snapping turtle, four-toed salamander, and fisher are all vulnerable species here in Nova Scotia. So then from species identification, we're able to start building our table again. Uh, so you can see the guilds are listed here, but each species was also still included in the study. This was done so that species of specific interest could be displayed and specifically targeted, but would still allow for more wider application in terms of the guilds as well. So this means we would be able to pick out a species, say the mainland moose, and see exactly which mitigation options would be best for them, but also it would be able to look at just generalists and say, well, most of our species fall under this category, this option will work for the widest variety of species. So while some species do have several different types of options they will use, a lot have a preference, or some of them do have a preference, which is depicted here with the subscript one, as you'll see beside the mainland moose and the white-tailed deer. Overall, we can see that of the 13 species, all of them would use a wildlife overpass, although it may require some small adaptations. Next criteria to look at was location, and we need to consider two things. One is the actual topography, and the second is traffic. So in terms of topography, we would need to know if it's a level, slope, below grade, or raise, where the, the uh, road lays, sorry, and the traffic volume if it's high or low traffic. As you'll see here, the traffic volume only matters for a few of our mitigation options, which is why a lot of them you'll see just grayed out with non-applicable. You can also see that as the mitigation options become more effective, they also become more locationally specific. So as we were just saying, our underpass is our probably most likely uh, to be used by all of our species, but also becomes more locationally specific. It can only be placed where there is level or raised um, topography. The final and often most influential criteria is cost. So of course, cost does not mean that the option is not feasible at all, but it does relate back to how much the municipality or province is expecting to spend at each site, and the less expensive mitigation options are often more favorable. Another variable that's directly linked to, to cost and the economic feasibility is their uh, lifespan, so that was included in this study as well. While mit mitigation options can actually be retrofitted to existing infrastructure, it comes with a higher, it tends to at least come with a higher cost than if the infrastructure would be put in alongside the development of a new road, which was done in Banff National Park. Um, and it could be done, this could be the method taken if the proposed Highway 113 is ever to be actually planned. Um, so based on similar studies and research, a structure that is financially feasible is considered to be under $600,000. Partially feasible would be between $600,000 and a million. And anything over a million dollars in construction would be considered the least favorable. 
based on this table, we can see that those with higher price tags, tags sorry, also tend to have a higher, a longer lifespan, a lot of them lasting over 70 years. Additionally, although I couldn't depict it in these tables, another thing to consider is that some of these mitigation options actually pay for themselves based on a reduction in wildlife vehicle collisions. One really great example of this was a underpass project put in Dead Man's Flat, Alberta, and it paid for itself in less than five years. The project itself cost about $500,000, but they were saving over $100,000 annually as a result of reduction in wildlife vehicle collisions. So this is something that should also be considered in the planning stages. So this may not be the most legible for you, but this is what the table looks like when we put the entire feasibility assessment together. Um, you've got all four of your criteria across the top, broken down by sub-criteria, and then you've got all six of your uh, mitigation options along the side, on the left-hand side, sorry, there. This table is specific to the, the peninsula based on species, but it could also be used uh, for any other site within the area as well for provincial or, or uh, provincial or municipal planning, sorry, both focusing specifically on the location. So with that, um, this was then applied to each of the corridors mentioned in the Halifax Green Network Plan. Of course, I don't have time right now to walk you through each of them, but we will go through one example just to kind of show you how this was applied in the final report. So of the three uh, corridors that were presented in the Halifax Green Network Plan and through some site visits and GIS analysis, this was the best option. Keeping in mind, although it's the best option, it is by no means the perfect option. As you can see here, that there are some waterways that definitely impact the corridor here as well. But looking at that pinch point around the, the roads, we'll have to analyze both Highway 103 and Highway 3 separately based on location. So this is a close up of the exact area where we would be looking. So Highway 103 is on the bottom half of that map there. And in this area, it is a level landscape with the exception of this little area here where it is raised. So from there, we have to then do two separate analyses. So looking first at the level areas, a wildlife overpass would be the most feasible here based on our landscape traffic levels, um, our effectiveness and all of our species. The only drawback would be the cost where it will cost over a million dollars in construction. But a highlight would be that all 13 of our species would use this option. Looking at that little raised area there, we'll see it changes slightly and instead a large underpass would be the best option, catering to all of our species except for our specialist species and it would be a bit more economically feasible. So anyone who might be familiar with this area, you'll probably know then that in this exact area, there's actually already an underpass that exists. This is where the Bluff Wilderness Trail goes under the, the Highway 103. Because of the existing infrastructure, it was then recommended that instead, the existing underpass be retrofitted to be a multi-use underpass. This would still cater to most of our species um, and would allow for um, a retrofit to be done rather than brand new construction. And so if we were to jump just to Highway 3, which is on the top part of your screen there, it's again level. So we'll see that a wildlife overpass is our best option again. So just to conclude those results for this one corridor on the leveled areas of both Highway 103 and Highway 3, a wildlife overpass is favorable. However, because of the existing infrastructure on Highway 103, it may be a better option to retrofit the existing infrastructure. It would also be recommended that because there is that existing underpass there that wildlife cameras actually be set up so we can see what, if any, animals are already using that underpass just to help give us a better idea of what the next step should be. A theme that also quickly emerged throughout the study are that overpasses and underpasses are the most effective mitigation options based on the variable, all variables except cost. And even then the cost of the structures can often be very balanced out by their reduction in wildlife vehicle collisions over a short uh, time period as well. So this feasibility assessment was applied to those specific sites. However, it was also given to the municipality to use in other planning on the peninsula. And with that, there were some next steps included as well. So the first next step would be to compare it was, it's recommended that further data in regards to wildlife vehicle collisions be examined to determine possible hotspots and it can be compared to the current site recommendations. 
There is an issue here in that Nova Scotia only collects wildlife vehicle collision data if there's damage of over $2,000 or if there is an injury that results. And other uh, collisions are only reported if someone actually calls them in. So this data is very insufficient, but it would be a good place to start to see where things are, our larger mammals like our deer are trying to cross. It's also recommended that a habitat suitability and least cost analysis be performed to compare the results, again, to see where species currently are actually trying to cross and if it lines up with what was recommended in the Health Actually Network Plan. And finally, finally, this framework also should also be used when the time comes to plan Highway 113, if it's going to be constructed, and any other development in the area for that matter. This assessment should also be used for planning and incorporating mitigation options into the existing infrastructure and development as it uh, progresses. Uh, and again, the use of, of cameras would be a great addition to that current underpass just to see what's going on there. So I just quickly wanted to thank Karen Baisley. She was my supervisor for my master's and she offered a tremendous amount of support throughout this project and my master's uh, degree. And thank you to Ben Civic, who is the principal planner for HRM for his support and interest in the project and for providing the data. So with that, um, thank you everyone who was able to join and listen in and I definitely open up the floor to any questions you may have. That was great. Thank you so much, uh, Megan. Jane has a question. Can you see that? Not working on it. Okay. Uh, I can just read it. Uh, she yeah, says, I, can, I, I can see, <laughs> all good. Um, I see that some of the pictures show that, do you want to ask it yourself, Jane? <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can ask the question, I guess. Uh, just in some of the pictures, it looked like there was fencing that kind of guided wildlife towards that. Um, is that always used? And if it is, you know, how long does it have to be to be effective? Is, is that yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, but just wondered if there's a kind of minimum, minimum distance to make it effective. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. And so within existing infrastructure, mostly in North America, and a lot of the most successful infrastructure is in actually in Alberta and Nevada. Um, and most times fencing is used in combination with a crossing structure because it will actually funnel them to it and prevent them from trying to cross at a different point and never probably being hit. So it is used. The it's kind of inconclusive on how much, how long of a distance you need. The general rule seems to be about five kilometers on either side, but it really, it's going to be species dependent as well as landscape dependent. In some areas, especially along Highway 103, you actually already have some kind of like little cliffs that would act as fencing themselves, so you wouldn't need it. Another consideration is what species you're looking at, because that'll also determine what size of fencing you need, because they do have large fencing meant for mammals, as well as smaller fencing meant for things like raccoons, coyotes, and things like that. But it does increase the uh, connectivity and the use of the structures substantially. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other? Questions from anybody? Oh, I'm just coming out of that full screen there. Dan waved hello. Um, great. Uh, I didn't have any questions either. I thought it was a fantastic study. Um, start to finish. Uh, um, Emma, I have a question. This is Kalyani. Ah, hello. Uh, how are you? Good, how are you? Uh, good, thank you. Uh, Megan, fantastic study, Megan. Uh, excellent presentation as well. Um, I have a question. My, um, it might be uh, a silly question, but uh, uh, how did you collect data and how long did you collect the data for? Yeah, so that's a great question as well. So this uh, master's research was done over one semester. So the data was collected over that one semester. The species data specifically had actually been collected previously for other studies and then was just shared with me. Um, so the species data was collected beforehand and through firsthand knowledge of actually driving the roads and what we saw. Uh -huh. But the rest of it was done over a four month period. And that was the taken by putting some camera traps or cam uh, 
like you know i'm i'm uh, i'm i'm not sure uh, like you know when you trace the animals moving here and there was it done by field work or by camera yeah Putting so camera in, there. in the halifax green network plan it was just done by desktop analysis so just by gis data um, okay, they did not actually do any on-site visits and that was actually a part of a different study I did. So I actually went and looked at these sites. So that was done with GIS. My data was mostly, mostly just literature review. So looking at current examples of where such infrastructure or mitigation options exist and extrapolating that to this area. Um, the okay, species okay. data was through um, organizations like Nature Conservancy of Canada, who have mm -hmm. uh, on the ground knowledge of the area, as well as um, a few other NGOs in the area as well. So they would have collected it through various means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, it looks like there's another question in the chat. So it's, do you think the yearly increase in the number of electric cars, which are more silent, is going to influence some of the research on road mortality and wildlife? I think that's a great question, and yes, it absolutely will. I think it's going to change things as well. We're even just seeing um, with humans that there's because they're so silent that they're having some issues there. Um, so I do think it'll be something to consider. And I think in general, road ecology is just so important, especially in Nova Scotia, where we've got such a dense our roads are so dense and they're so the habitat is so fragmented that no matter what type of car you're going to have issues and just adding the fact that they're quieter i mean i'm sure we all drive around we see that there are always deer things on the side of the road that aren't impacted by the, the sound of gasoline cars so i can only imagine that a quieter car would cause even bigger problems i do think this is an area of research that needs more attention All right. Um, I have a question. Hi, Megan. Excellent presentation. Um, was there any discussion about reintroducing uh, species that were low in population or at risk of declining populations or extinctions back into areas that um, that could use more of those species in there? Like, was was that ever discussed, or did you have any discussions on those? Yeah, so it was, there weren't discussions like that directly related to this study. However, I've definitely had some discussions of that with um, people I've worked with, for sure. I mean, there's always the kind of running joke of reintroducing wolves back into Nova Scotia, um, which is always kind of a funny one, um, especially with mainland moose. There has been conversation about maybe reintroducing moose. Um, a lot of the time, though, when you think about endangered or extricated or extinct species, there's a reason that they are at that status. Um, so, for example, the mainland moose. Nova Scotia is geographically not big enough to sustain a mainland moose population. Um, so there's a reason that they are being, they are so endangered. So even with reintroduction, like from a person, personally, I just, I think you're setting yourself up for failure unless you're going to change some of the deeper barriers and their deeper restrictions of why these populations are decreasing. But it is something that I know a lot of people are talking about. Megan, I have another question. Um, just thinking about that, you mentioned that um, there's a cost saving because you're preventing accidents from happening um, and that that payback can happen quite quickly. How did they actually calculate the cost of that? You know, what, where does that cost um, come from when, when there is a collision? Is, is it the police being brought in or the, you know, salvage of the corpse, that kind of thing? Um, from my understanding, it's a combination of kind of all of it. So it would actually be partly insurance claims and the damage done to vehicles, um, which seems to be the biggest one, as well as, like you said, the corpse removal and management, things like that. Um, I actually, and then the way that they, specifically in Dead Man's Flat, they actually did, uh, they um, recorded wildlife vehicle collisions in the area five years prior to construction and then five years post-construction. So they, they were able to actually have the data to compare what it was like before and what it was like after to actually evaluate their cost savings. Wow, that's really interesting, thank you. Um, 
I would ask uh, the question, we had the question from uh, Anne about um, using data of, of protected species to, to use wildlife corridors. Are there any uh, other ways that you would sort of, you know, from a planning perspective, look at where wildlife corridors would be useful um, on a provincial or just sort of municipal scale? Yeah, so definitely for that, the tool that was recommended and one of the next steps I recommended would be looking at a least cost analysis. So that would be a GIS desktop analysis that actually looks at where species are most likely to be traveling or migrating or what habitat they're going to be using. Um, and then that often once that's done, it can be backed up by on the field studies. It's really hard though because their the habitat is so fragmented and species they're very adaptable. Most are very adaptable. So it's hard to say that just because you build something does not mean they're going to use it, right? So it's, there is kind of that uncertainty there, unfortunately. Um, but GIS is a great tool to start predicting and to start planning. Very cool. Okay. Um, any last questions? I'll leave the floor open for 30 seconds, just in case anyone thinks of something. Thank you so much for your, your, the entire presentation was so fantastic, Megan, your answers, everything. Great. We can't thank you enough. Um, okay. Uh, great. Uh, if anyone has um, any more questions uh, for Megan, uh, feel free to email me. You already have my, my contact and I'll forward them on. Um, yeah. Other than that, Thank you so much everyone for coming to uh, the webinar and um, we'll see you uh, next week. We have uh, Millie Sanchez. We haven't put the poster out for this one yet, but she's talking about her research on uh, the parental um, uh, behaviors of seals on Sable Island. So that should be pretty interesting. Uh, if you'd like to tune in, same Zoom link as always. Okay, then. Thanks everyone.